Okay, so I'm going to attempt to address some of the questions that you guys have had about the windscreen failure. And uh, hopefully this will be the last video I do on this. I'm kind of wanting to move on from it as well. Uh, it's not something I really want to keep on uh, rehashing and reliving uh, every time I turn around. <clears throat> anyway, but I, I had no idea that the video was going to be as popular as it was. I had no idea it was going to blow up. And um, there's been something like 300 comments on it. And there's no way I, can, I, can't, I can't respond to each one of them. So I just uh, picked out a handful of them that seem to be the most common. And we're going to address those uh, in this video. So here we go. First one, uh, the elephant in the room. What caused the windscreen to blow out? Was it a bird? No, it wasn't a bird. What happened? It was a failure. It just failed. It's not uncommon. It happens. I had a, a friend that lost a windscreen in his twin engine Cessna at 18,000 feet. It happens with all kinds of airplanes. Uh, it's not something that's just totally foreign. It, it, it does happen. Generally, it happens when you hit something, but we didn't hit anything. So there is something that I do want to point out here is that if you go back and watch that video a couple of seconds prior to the blowout, uh, there was something atmospheric that changed. I'm not blaming it on that. I don't know what it was. It was a typical hot summer day in Arkansas. It's anywhere between 95 and 100 degrees outside. We had a two knot headwind and it wasn't rough. We didn't have a lot of turbulence. It was just a hot summer day. And a couple of seconds um, prior to the failure, actually it's less than a couple of seconds prior to failure, you'll notice that the altimeter jumps up by nearly 100 feet, and then at the bottom right, uh, the vertical speed indicator shows a 500 foot per minute ascent, and the airspeed indicator goes from about the middle of the yellow arc, or the middle of the green arc, rather, to uh, well into the yellow arc. We're flying straight and level, so we had, we've, we've hit something in the air meteorologically. Um, now, am I blaming it on that? No, I don't know that, that that had any bearing, but it could have exacerbated something that was already there. It is also important to note that that is a first-gen windscreen, which was made out of a, a material called PETG. It's two millimeters thick. And they have subsequently came out uh, in January of 2020 with a three millimeter thick different material. It's a thermoformed piece of plastic now and not a flat piece that was formed as it's riveted into the airframe. So the updated version is stronger, it's thicker, uh, it's not under stress just sitting there in its natural state. There is a service bulletin on the old style windscreens, which is what we have had, <laughs> what we had. And that service bulletin states that you are to inspect the windscreen around the rivet uh, holes. And if a crack has protruded past the aluminum framing strips, then the windscreen must be replaced. The service bulletin had been complied with on this airplane at every annual inspection, annual condition inspection, and it has become something that was part of my normal pre-flight routine when I clean the bugs off the windscreen. I just give it a cursory glance inside and out. Now, by verbiage of that service bulletin, you would assume uh, that if no cracks were present, that it's okay to just fly that windscreen. I can also say that if anything good has come out of this, two days after our incident, the factory came out with a mandatory replacement of all old style windscreens to the new updated style. And they've put a limitation on the V&E to 75 knots. So V&E on those old windscreens are now 75 knots until replaced, at which time it goes back up to whatever the normal V&E is of that aircraft. It never gets that fast, so I couldn't tell you what V&E is. It, uh, just, it's fast. It's way faster than, than, than that airplane will ever go with me flying it, unless I'm in a straight dive. Am I still happy with the airplane? Yeah, I'm happy with the airplane. It's a great airplane. It's uh, built exceptionally well. Had a windscreen issue that's been fixed. Um, but it's, it's a great stole performer. It's a comfortable airplane. It flies about as fast as I need it to. And um, 
the visibility out of it is second to none. I've, I'm very pleased with the aircraft and yes, I'm still happy with it. Something else that people have asked is, do I expect there to be any kind of assistance from the factory on windscreen replacement? And no, I don't. I don't, it would be great if they did. I think that would be a, um, I think it would be a, a good faith measure from the factory to help those that are affected with this, but it's not typical in the aviation industry to receive factory help for something that's not a warranty issue. So I'm not expecting it. I don't, I don't think they will. Um, be great if they did, but if they don't, they don't. It is what it is. So the other real big question was, uh, why did I lose altitude? Why could I not maintain altitude? And there could be a couple of different reasons for that. One of them could be that uh, I just ran out of talent. Maybe there was just, maybe I just, you know, wasn't good enough. I think that's the answer that some of you want to hear. And um, the fact is the airframe was really dirty. It had a lot of drag and I could not hold full power and function in the cockpit like I needed to. The prop wash at full power was just unsettling. It was, it was a distraction. I had to keep my sunglasses on because I wear contacts and my contacts blow out. I got to reach down and put on glasses. That's another layer of problems that I don't need. So I tried full power. Um, I couldn't get, I couldn't really get any more altitude out of it at full power. If I put it at full power and pitched it up, then the airplane would porpoise a little bit, which made me uncomfortable. I didn't like that porpoising because I, at this point, I still don't know what damage is on the tail. All of this plastic that's left and flown backwards, do I have a control surface issue? Um, the control surfaces are fabric. So do I have a, a ripped elevator, a ripped rudder? I don't know. So, you know, it was, it was a decision that I made to not go to fly any further. You fix what you can fix right now. And if you can't fix it, you just don't worry about it. And um, once you fix the first problem, then move on and fix the next thing you can fix. And, and the things you can't fix, don't let it distract you. But I was really unwilling to try to climb at the risk of losing airspeed because I'm already flying at about 60 miles an hour now anyway. The airplane stalls at, I don't know, 37 miles an hour or something like that dirty. It could be 34. Anyway, it's between 34 and 37 miles an hour. 60 miles an hour is, you know, almost double its stall speed, but it is really draggy and it's really dirty at this point. Um, some people pointed out that there was a field below us. Um, yeah, there was. There was a field right directly below us. I didn't know exactly what the condition of that field was. There was also a field to our right that looked like it had a road on it. Um, I don't know, you know, it, the road could be rutted. It could have potholes. Um, just didn't feel good about it. So I chose what I chose. I'm happy I chose what I chose. It was closer than it actually looks in the video. It wasn't way out there. It was relatively close. And um, I could add a little power and extend the glide. Uh, so I wasn't too worried about making it. it just wasn't that far away. And uh, I was really just, like I said before, I was unwilling to fly that airplane any further into our, what could be our own death. I couldn't make it over the ridge in front of us. I knew that. And um, it's 10 miles, it was 10 miles to the nearest airport. And um, as far as the field below us, I could, I could fly straight fairly well, but I didn't know how the airplane would react if I put it in a spiral down to a field below us. And I was really unwilling to make that, that decision. Um, you know, when all else fails, if I find out I can't make the field in front of us for whatever reason, I can pull the parachute. It's a last ditch effort. I don't want to have to do that, but the parachute, you know, could save your life. If I try to extend this and go out further, then all I got, like I said, national force, pull the parachute, you get hung up in a tree, you're 50 feet off the ground and, um, and help could be hours away. 
So I did what I did. I made the decisions I made, and I would do them again. Good looking RV. I do it again uh, tomorrow if the same set of circumstances presented themselves. I don't think I would change a thing. I would do exactly what I did this time. And um, anyway, that's it. Uh, the next video I'm going to put out is uh, Jerry and I leaving Oshkosh, uh, flying over the seaplane base. Won't be a real long video. Won't be any commentary. It's just going to be some aerial footage of us leaving. And uh, then. I'll see what else I can come up with for you guys. Um, it's going to be a little while getting this thing repaired and back in the air, but as soon as we do, we'll uh, start putting out some more aviation content. But I appreciate you guys' questions. I appreciate uh, the thoughtfulness um, that you guys have extended to both myself and Karina. I appreciate the pats on the back, but I don't uh, I don't feel like I did anything extraordinary. I just did what I was taught to do. And um, other than that, um, yeah. I think I'm going to end it at that. I appreciate all you guys for following along. And uh, subscribe if you haven't. I give it a like if you liked it. And uh, we'll see you on the next one. Appreciate you guys. Have a great day.